Hey guys, Andy Robertson here at CQE Academy, and in today's video, I want to teach you and share with you all about attribute data control charts. Whether you're implementing a control chart for the first time, or whether you're preparing for an exam like the CQE exam, the Green Belt exam, or maybe the Black Belt exam, this is all stuff you're going to need to know on exam day or in your job to be successful. All right, let's head over to the computer and get started. All right, let's check out today's agenda. So the first topic we're going to touch on is this really interesting distinction that we make between defects and defectives. This might feel like we're splitting hairs here, but this is a really important distinction because it affects which control charts that we should be using uh, within our process. So we're going to start by talking about the differences between defects and defectives. And then we're going to use that in the second uh, slide where we talk about choosing the right control chart. So depending on whether you're using defects or defectives and how your sample size might either change or stay constant, that affects which control chart you should or should not be using. And then we're going to walk through the four most common control charts, the MP chart, the P chart, the C chart, and the U chart. All right, let's go ahead and get into this. Okay, so defects versus defectives. So a defective unit is an entire unit that fails to meet specifications. Now, I include this picture of this light bulb because there are a number of different things about this light bulb that might make it a defective unit. The filament might be broken, the glass might be cracked, the electrical connections might be damaged. Whatever it is, this single unit, if it were to be inspected, could be considered a defective unit if there was anything wrong with it. Now, a defect is an undesirable condition within a unit. So I want to use this classic example of, like, let's say, a car door. So let's say we're building cars, we have a car door, and we're inspecting our car door, and we find six different defects. So we find three scratches, two runs, and one bubble. Now, on this single unit, we have six different defects, okay? Now, this entire car door is considered a defective unit. So if a unit has a defect on it, it is a defective unit, and a single defective unit can have multiple defects. The reason this distinction is important is because it, it changes the way we select our control charts. So let's talk about that now. So there are two variables that, that we have to consider when choosing the right control chart. The first is what type of data we're counting and collecting. If we're counting defectives, that would be a different control chart than if we were counting defects. And then for the sample size, again, whether your sample size is constant or variable, again, changes the type of control chart you would use. So the first type of control chart we're going to talk about is, is the most basic. It's the NP chart. And what we're doing here is we're trending a count of defective units with a constant sample size. So if we're, if we're trending defective units with a constant sample size, you want to use an NP chart. If you're trending defective units with a variable sample size, you want to use a P chart. And then the C chart. If you change gears here and you're talking about defects instead of defectives and you have a constant sample size, we can use the C chart. And then if you are trending defects with a variable sample size, you want to use the U chart. Now, the reason we make this distinction between defective units and defects is because it changes the probability distribution that underlines or that forms the foundation of our control limits. So when we're talking about defective units and every single unit that is inspected can only be counted as bad one time, we're using the binomial distribution. If we're counting up defects and a single unit could be inspected and contain multiple defects, we have to use the Poisson distribution. And that's why it's really important to understand whether you're trending defects or defectives because it changes that underlying probability distribution and it changes the way our control limits are calculated. All right, so now let's start with the MP chart. So remember, we're, we're using the MP chart when we're training defective items with a constant sample size. Now there's two variables here that we have to calculate in order to complete our control chart. The first is the center of our process. We call this NP. This is the average number of defective items per subgroup. We're gonna do an example in a minute here where I show you how to calculate this and what it means or what it looks like on the control chart. The second variable that we have to calculate is P bar. This is the percent defectives per subgroup. And again, we, I'll show you in the example how to calculate this. Once we have those two parameters, we can then calculate the control limits for our control chart. You can see it here. The upper control limit is NP, that's the average or the center of our process, plus three times the square root of NP times one minus P. And again, the lower control limit is just minus instead of plus. 
All right, let's look at some data now to help you understand both how to do these calculations and then we'll look at a chart so you can kind of visualize what this all means. So we have 15 different subgroups or lots and then within each lot, we have a subgroup size of 120 units per subgroup. By the way, this here says lot size, that's incorrect. This 120 units is actually a subgroup, it's a sample from a larger population or a larger lot size. So that actually is incorrect, uh, that should say subgroup size. And in total, ac across these 15 subgroups, we've sampled 1800 units. Now basically what our inspectors do is, as they take these 120 pieces, they simply just count up how many defective units they find. 12, 20, 20, 6, 14, 6, and on and on and down we go. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this data to create our control limits. And the first variable we need to calculate is NP. This is the center of our process. And the way we do this is we calculate the sum of NP. This is the sum of defective units. So in total, across these 15 different subgroups, we had a total of 199 defective units. And we found those defective units across 15 subgroups. And you can see that here, that's the variable K. And what we do is when we normalize the defective units per subgroup, we find that on average, we had 13.27 defective units per subgroup. And that makes sense. If you just kind of scroll your eyes down this list here, 13 seems like a, a pretty rough average number of all of these defective units that we found. Now the second variable we have to calculate is p-bar. This is the percent defective that we found in our inspection. Now the way we calculate this is slightly different. We still start with the, the count of defective items in our numerator. So we start with 199 units, and we found those 199 defective units when we sampled 1,800 samples. So the sum of N is simply just right here. In those 15 subgroups, we inspected 1,800 units, and that comes out to about an 11% defect rate. Now that we have MP and P-bar, we can calculate the upper and lower control limits as 23.58 and 2.96. You can see how I just kind of plugged in those variables here. Now I want to help you visualize this. So the first thing I've done is I've put those major factors down here on the, on the bottom, those major parameters, the center lines 13.27, upper and lower control limits. Here's the NP chart. You can see the center line here in green. This is the center of our process. On average, we get about 13 defective units per subgroup. You can also see I've got our upper and lower control limits on here. And then all we're doing is we're asking our team to basically plot out the, the count of defective units uh, per subgroup. You can see this here, 12, 20, 26, 14. And in general, this process looks like it's stable and in control. All right, now let's talk about the P chart. So we were on the MP chart here with a constant sample size. Let's talk about how the, the equations change and how the analysis changes when we have a variable sample size. So remember, we're, we use the P chart when we're training defective items with a variable sample size. There are two parameters here, or two variables that we have to calculate. P bar, which is the exact same calculation uh, as it was with the MP chart. And then this new variable is called N bar. A bar basically just means average. So N bar means the average of N or the average sample size. And let's do an example here to, to show you what that looks like. By the way, here's how we're going to calculate the upper and lower control limits when using the, the P chart. By the way, if you want all of these equations, I've got a great free cheat sheet. Go to cqacademy.com slash free cheat sheet. It's got all of the equations you'll need on the CQE exam. Uh, go over there, sign up, and you get a free cheat sheet. And that's going to be super helpful on exam day. It's going to save you a ton of time in the exam instead of having to look up equations. They're all right there for you. Okay, so let's do this example. So we've got all of our equations here on the left, and let's look at a data set here to talk about how we would calculate these control limits. So again, this should be subgroup size, and you can see the subgroup size changes. 200, 220, 180, 240. Every time we take a different sample, the size is slightly different. And so we need to account for that in the way we, the way we calculate our control limits. Now, we're still counting up the number of defective units, so we're going to give these samples to our inspector or operator, and they're going to do the inspection and count up the number of defective items. But because we have a variable sample size, we have to add a new calculation. This is the percentage of defective items. Now, this calculation is simply just 8 divided by 200, and that's 4%. Similarly, right, if we did 11 divided by 240, that would come out to 4.6%. Now we can use this data to calculate those variables. 
So P bar is the average percent defective. And so what we do here is we take the sum total of all defective units, that's the sum of NP, that's 140. We had 140 defective items divided by the sum of N. In total, we inspected 3,060 samples and we found 140 defective units, meaning that our defective rate is 4.58%. That is P bar. Now for N bar, this is the average sample size. On average, how many samples did we take? And what we do is we essentially sum this up, right? We take the sum total of N, which is 3,060, and we divide by the number of subgroup sizes, K, to get 204 sample sizes. That makes sense, right? If you kind of scan this column, you'll notice that on average, we have about 200 samples per subgroup. Now we can take these two parameters, P bar and N bar, and plug them in to calculate our upper and lower control limits, 8.969, 0.19%. And now we can talk about what this looks like graphically. So again, I've, I've left those major parameters here on bottom, and here's what the chart looks like. So you can see our lower control limit, upper control limit. You can see the center of our process here in green, that's P bar, that's that 4.58%. And then what you actually see on the chart here in blue is the process. This is the trend line for the process. And what we're doing is we're plotting these individual percent defectives, 4%, 3.2, 2.8, 3.8, 5.5, 6.7. And you can see here the y-axis is actually in percent defective. And for each subgroup, we essentially just plot another data point for percent defective. Now, there's something unique about the p-chart in that the uh, control limits can actually be recalculated using the individual subgroup sizes. So here in these calculations for upper and lower control limit, instead of using n-bar and calculating just one generic control limit, you can actually calculate control limits for each individual subgroup if you wanted to do that. And you can see how the control limits change as the sample size fluctuates. Okay, now we're done talking about control charts for defectives. Now let's talk about defects. And the first one to talk about is the C chart. This is probably the, the easiest. There's only one parameter that we need to calculate when we talk about the C chart, and that is C bar. This is the average number of defects per subgroup. And then once we, once we calculate C bar, we can then plug that in to the upper and lower control limits. So let's look at our data here and talk about how we calculate C bar. So again, we have 20 subgroups. You can see that here. Within each subgroup, we sample 500 units. And then what, what we have our team do or what we have our inspectors do is simply just count the number of defects they find in their inspection. So in total, we inspected 10,000 pieces and we found 95 defects. So now let's talk about C bar. C bar is the average number of defects per subgroup. So what we do is we take those 95 defects we found, we divide by the 20 subgroups that we found them in, and we calculate that on average, we find about 4.75 defects per subgroup. And again, that makes sense, right? If you kind of scan this data, you'll find that, yeah, on average, there's about four or five defects within each subgroup, right? Within these subgroups. And then we can take that value of 4.75 and simply just plug it in to calculate the upper and lower control limits, 11.29 and minus 1.79. Now, if you ever get a negative number here for your lower control limit, basically what you do is you round that up to zero because you can't have a negative number of defects in an inspection. So the lower control limit is basically zero. Now, graphically, let's see what this looks like. Again, you'll see our lower control limit here is at zero upper control limit 11.29. And essentially what we have our team do is they simply just plot the count of defects. They call it a C chart. We're simply just counting the number of defects that we find in the inspection. Does that make sense? And then you can see here green, this is the center line of our process, right? This is the average of our process. And on average, we have about 4.75 defects per subgroup. All right, let's keep going here with the U chart. So again, the U chart is used when we're trending defects and we have a variable sample size. So let's let's take a look at what that what that looks like. Okay, so when we talk about the U chart, there's two parameters that we have to calculate to calculate our control charts. U bar, which is essentially the average percent defects per subgroup, and N bar, which is the average number of samples per subgroup. And once we understand those two parameters, U bar and N bar, we can then calculate our upper and lower control limits. So it's simply just U bar 
plus three times the square root of u bar divided by n bar. That's the upper control limit. And then, of course, for the lower control limit, the only thing we change is we subtract that three standard deviations. And then similar to the P chart, the U chart is actually flexible enough where you can recalculate your control limits based on your actual sample size instead of your average sample size. So again, let's look at some data here. We've got those equations on the left. And then this first column here, the, the subgroup size, you can see here that it changes, right? Every time we take a different subgroup, the quantity changes. And then again, what we have our team do is when they do their inspection, just count up the number of defects that were observed within that subgroup. So for example, within subgroup one, we inspected 100 pieces, 100 samples. We found eight defects. Now we can use that data to calculate the percent defects within each subgroup. So here we had 10 defects over 100 pieces. That's a 10% defect rate. And then to calculate U-bar, this is simply just the average percent defects. So the way we calculate that is on the new, in the numerator here, we have the sum of C, which is simply just a sum of how many defects that we counted. So in total, we had 117 defects. You can see that here. And we, we found those defects after sampling 1,560 total pieces, which means on average, our defect rate or the, the percent defects per subgroup is 7.5%. The other variable we have to calculate is n-bar. So we sampled 1,560 pieces, again you can see that here, and we did that across 15 different subgroups, which means on average we sampled 104 samples per subgroup. Does that make sense? And again, you can kind of scan this, this column here, and you can see that, okay, yeah, on average we have about, you know, 100 pieces per, uh, per subgroup, and it comes out to 104 is the exact answer. And then we can take those two variables and we can plug them into our upper and lower control limits. You can see it here, 7.5%, 104, and our upper control limit comes out to 15.56. Lower control limit, again, comes out to a negative number, which we simply round up to zero. And so again, I'm, I'm showing those major parameters here, the center of our process, the upper and lower control limit. And here's what our control chart looks like. Again, the, the y-axis here is, is in percent defects. And I made a mistake here. This lower control limit should actually be at 0%. Right now it's showing as a, as a negative percent, which doesn't make any sense. You can see the center of our process here at 7.5% defects. And then all we're plotting in blue is simply just the percent defects within each subgroup. So 8%, 8.3, 11.3, 4.3, 10.0. You can see how this kind of jumps around 6.3 back to 10, 8.3. But in general, our process here appears to be stable and in control. And then, like I said, similar to the P chart, you can actually calculate unique control limits for every sample size. So for example, let's look at subgroup 11 here. We only inspected 60 pieces. So we could actually calculate specific control limits using 60 instead of N bar. So remember we used N bar, which was 104, to calculate our generic control limits. If you wanted to, you could use the actual subgroup size and, and you could see your control limits change as your sample size fluctuates. All right, that was it for today's lecture. I hope you really enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button so that other people just like you can find this. And if you want to subscribe and you want to stay on this journey to become a CQE, hit that subscribe button and that bell icon. That way as I publish new material, you get notified and you can stay on this journey to become a CQE. All right, thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye.